All righty. Well, thanks everybody for joining me. <clears throat> I'm Dan Harlicker. I'm the VP of product here at On One, but I've been a lifelong photographer. And today I wanted to share with you guys some tips and tricks for how to be creative around the house when you're stuck inside. I grew up here in Oregon, so it's oftentimes rainy and yucky in the wintertime and there's just not a whole lot to shoot, but I didn't have the, uh, all the gear to do crazy stuff. So let me just share my screen here. I'm just going to show you guys a few sample photos of the kind of stuff I'm gonna show you guys how to create today. So let me get this going here. There we go, hopefully that's working. All right, so all these shots that I'm gonna show you, these were all created using the same tips and techniques that we're gonna show you today. One of the great things about photographing objects that you already have in your house is you've already got kind of an intimacy with them. They're things that are important to you. You don't have to necessarily go out and find a whole bunch of new things. There's always interesting things around your house. Uh, it could be stuff from your kitchen, utensils in the kitchen. A lot of us have plants or flowers that we grow around the house. I'm an old camera buff, so I always have lots of old cameras to shoot. The other great thing about these things is they tend to be pretty small. So you don't need a big studio. You don't need lots of lights. You don't have to be fancy about it. And I'm going to show you how to take these kind of photos with really hardly anything at all. We'll go over a gear list here in just a second so you guys can kind of see what you need. But none of these photos were captured with anything fancier than the setup that I'm going to show you guys here in just a second. And of course, all these photos I've done a little bit of editing in Photo Raw with. All right. So here's the stuff that you're going to need. First thing you need, you need a space where you can control the brightness. So usually like a spare bedroom where you've got a window with a curtain that you can close, you need a space that you can get fairly dark. It doesn't need to be completely black. A little bit of light is okay, but you wanna be able to control your lighting. So just about any place will work for that. You need a table to set up on, any table will do. I'm just using a card table today. The next thing you need, and this is a pretty important piece, is you need a camera with a lens that you can get a little bit close with. Now, most lenses, even the kit lenses that come on an inexpensive camera, We'll get down pretty close and I'll give you a tip on how to get the closest focus you can out of your lenses. If you put it in manual focus and then you manually focus it all the way out so that the lens is at its longest, that's the closest it's going to focus. Just leave it right there and then focus your camera by moving the camera back and forth. So hold it in your hands, move back and forth and you'll kind of find two things pretty quickly. You're going to find out how close that lens is going to focus, basically how far away you need to be from your subject matter. You know, it could be six to eight inches. It could be a foot, depending on the focal length of your lens. That'll give you an idea of where you're going to have to set up your tripod. And it's also going to let you know exactly what's the maximum uh, uh, magnification you can get, the closest you can get to your subject. Even on a kit lens that comes on most cameras, you can get down to something about the size of a business card, a pretty small area. And for most things, that's pretty close. So you don't have to have a fancy macro lens or extension tubes or all that fancy stuff to do the type of stuff that I'm going to do today. You do need a tripod though, that's an important part because what we're gonna use for lighting isn't a super powerful light. You can't handhold these photographs. These photos are gonna probably be in the quarter second, uh, eighth of a second range in terms of shutter speed. So handholding is kind of out of the question. So you do need a tripod. That's probably the only piece of, of uh, potentially not normal photographic gear that you're gonna need. <clears throat> Next thing you need is you need some sort of a background, something to shoot against. Now, it doesn't mean you have to go buy fancy backgrounds or seamless paper. There's lots of options. Today, I'm actually using some leftover wrapping paper. Uh, wrapping paper works great. Butcher paper, if you have some. Uh, a lot of us have like 13 by 19 inch photo printers. You can actually print out any background you want on that 13 by 19 paper for it. And even just a plain sheet of the 13 by 19 paper makes a nice plain white background. All right, uh, let's see, what else do we need? We need a light. So a light can be very, very basic. In today's scenario, I'm literally using the lamp off my bedside table. It's just a regular 60 watt light bulb in a lamp that every one of you probably has. That's really all you need. You just need a source of light that you can use. And then you need some, some stuff to modify and control it with. For me, I use a regular notebook paper is a great controller. You can use aluminum foil. Uh, you can use a hand mirror. There's lots of different things you can use to help control and bounce that around. A flashlight's also a great light source too. All right, before we move on, I see Nathan, he probably has some questions for us. No, we don't have any questions so far. That's crazy, Dan. You have all those things in your house. And <laughs> I'm excited to see you take some photos, Dan. Go ahead. Well, I mean, none of it's particularly esoteric. I mean, we all have some, we all have a table. We all have some paper. Uh, we all have a lamp. I mean, this is all really basic stuff. There's nothing that's a fancy piece of photographic equipment here at all. 
and then you need something that's interesting to you to photograph. So I brought a couple of things out and I'll show you what I've got. So the first thing I grabbed is actually a little, uh, what is this? Whatever kind of an orchid, a little orchid. And I have the one flower that hasn't fallen off of it yet. So I'm hoping it's gonna hold out and not fall off during our session today. And then I've got this beautiful little succulent that was on my bookcase in the library. And last but not least, I told you I'm a big camera fan of old cameras. So I have this old Kodak 1A camera that was sitting in there too. So I grabbed that. But like I said, all of us have something around our house that's interesting. Uh, if you're into tools, I bet you probably have some old hand tools that are very cool to photograph. If you're into cooking, you probably have some old spatulas or knives in your kitchen. Those can be very fun to photograph. Anything that you can photograph close and kind of bring up the intimate detail of it is a pretty interesting thing. All right, so let's get going here. I'm hoping you guys can see over here what my setup is. So all I did is I simply took some black wrapping paper. Someone turned 40 at my house. So I took some leftover black wrapping paper and I just taped it on the wall and made a sweep out of it. So it goes up the wall, down across the tabletop. Then I put my trusty camera on a tripod. That's a key part. It does need to be on a tripod, as I mentioned. And then for my light, like I mentioned, all I'm doing is I'm just using a simple 60 watt light bulb in a lamp. And I put it on a box here just to raise it up a little bit. And let's start off with that orchid. For you guys at home out there, if uh, you're trying to see uh, Dan, um demonstration yeah, in full me. screen go ahead and just double click on the uh that that little icon you see of him and you'll see the full presentation of dan there you we can, go i'll stop okay. sharing my screen that might make it bigger too. there you go yeah that works too yeah the other thing you can do is when we're actually sharing the screen there's an option in the top that says split screen mode or side by side mode rather and in side by side you'll see half the screen me half the screen my computer whatever i'm showing so we're going to be going back and forth between the two quite a bit all right, so I'm just gonna put my little orchid over here. I'm gonna face it towards the camera. And I'm gonna adjust my composition and we'll kind of take our first shot. Now I'm gonna shoot tethered today. Shooting tethered is kind of fun because it allows you to see your shot right away and let you make adjustments very easily. So I'm gonna share my screen again here. And I'm just gonna turn tethered shooting on inside of Photo Raw. Let me get this little go to meeting guy out of the way. I'm gonna, I'm gonna cheat because I did all my tests earlier today. So we'll just pretend that I'm tethered and I'll show you what we get as we go here. So just ignore the man behind the curtain for this. No problem, lots of questions coming in now. I've got plenty to do here. John Clark, the first rule of webinars is that everything <laughs> works perfectly right up until you go live. John Clark, that's, my good that's friend. That's pretty much it, yeah. that's John. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're just gonna pretend that I'm shooting these together live and I'll show you the adjustments as we go. So here was kind of the very first shot that we shot. It's like, oh my gosh, that looks awful, doesn't it? So there was a couple changes that we made to it. The first thing we did is in our tethered shooting fan is I changed the white balance. So because I'm shooting with a normal incandescent light bulb, I need to make sure that my white balance is set to incandescent. And simply making that change and then shooting another shot, got me to here. So that's obviously a big improvement. Let me make sure everybody is seeing my screen, right, Nathan? Yep, I can see the flower. Okay, so it's looking better, but you'll notice how it's still right up here on the top of the flower. It's a little overexposed, it's a little too hot, and the shadows have a pretty hard edge on them. So if we zoom in here a little bit, and we take a look, see how these shadows have a hard edge to them? I don't really like that hard edge. The other thing is, it's also just a squishy little bit out of focus. So what I'm gonna do is I changed my aperture. This first photo was taken at, get this out of the way here so we can look at our metadata, was shot at f5.6. So when you're shooting things pretty close up, 5.6 is still a pretty shallow depth of field. So I need to stop my lens down so that I can get a greater range in focus. So I just changed my depth of field. And then I did something very basic. In order to take those soft, those hard edges and make them soft, here's the simple trick. I just took a regular sheet of paper out of my printer, it's just regular thin bond paper, and I just held it right like this. So what that's doing is it's creating diffusion. It's taking this very hard edged, 
light coming from my lamp. This happens to be light coming out from underneath the shade of the lamp. I'm just gonna hold that right there. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna create a much larger, broader source of light. And I wanna hold it as close to my subject as I can. So I'm not gonna hold it over here at the lamp. I wanna move it as close to my subject as I can, but out of the shot. One of the great things you can do on your cameras is set it to the two or three second self timer. Almost all cameras have a short self timer mode on them. And that allows you to hold stuff with your hands and take the shot. It also makes sure that there's any wobble that the camera has goes away, especially if you have an inexpensive tripod. Pressing just the act of pressing the shutter button will wiggle the camera a little bit. So what I can do is I can just hold this piece of paper right there. I wanna have it as close to my subject as I can and as far in front of my subject as I can. That's gonna make that light wrap around the flower as much as possible. And then I just take another shot. There we go. And that led us to this shot right here. So you can see it's a pretty big difference. It's lost a lot of the contrast in the process. Remember this shot before having that very contrasty light. Some of you might actually like this rendition better, but keep in mind, this is shooting a shot that we can then adjust in the computer. So we wanna have it flat so we have all the tonal range and we can then mess with it via software instead. So there it is. Now I've got a greater depth of field. We zoom in here a little bit. When we let it load, you'll see that actually it's in sharper focus than the previous shot was. And those shadow edges are much softer compared between the two. So you can see they're very hard edge shadows to a much softer, more diffused shadow edge to it. Now, what I did like is the background is kind of boring on it. It's just that plain black. So here's what I did. I took a flashlight, just a simple flashlight we probably all have in our junk drawer or in our car. And I put that in one hand and I shined it on the paper on the background, just like that. And then I hold that other piece of paper out here. Uh oh, I'm out of hands. This is where that two or three second self timer comes in handy. So I'm gonna push the button on the camera. It's gonna get ready to take a picture. Boom, like that. That led us to a shot that looked like this. Now you're probably asking yourself, why is the background blue? Well, the reason is we're using two different color temperatures of light. My flashlight is a more of a modern LED. So it's gonna be more like a daylight. So it's gonna create a blue background when I have my camera set to incandescent instead. But it also gives it kind of this cool modeled look to it as well. And you can change that because most flashlights are focusable. You can change the focus. So you can have a very tight spotlight on the background or you can have a broader light source on the background. Dan, you wanna share with us what your camera setup is there and which lens you're using again? Uh, let's see, I am using, if we take a look up here in my info pane, I'm shooting with a Canon 5D Mark IV, and I'm using the 100 macro lens from Canon. That doesn't mean you have to use that, uh, anything fancy like that. Any DSLR will work for this. You can even do this with your iPhone. And to be honest, the iPhone is great when it comes to close-up photography. It gets very, very close. It's a little harder to hold steady on those longer shots unless you have one of the newer ones with the uh, in-camera stabilization. And then I happen to be, I'm shooting at a fairly high ISO at this point, like 1200 ISO. Modern cameras, that's nothing for them. Uh, and I happen to love grain. I grew up in the film days, a little grain doesn't scare me at all. So we're at an eighth of a second and five, six for my depth of field. So let's go to the next shot. Everybody close your eyes for a second so you don't see what the after's gonna look like. Let me reset it here. Whoop. All right, so there's our Final shot, you notice on this one, I did stop down a little bit. I was on five, six on the others. Now I'm at F11 and a half a second. I wanted that little bit extra depth of field and that way I could make sure everything was in focus on the flower, at least on the flower part. I wasn't as concerned about the stem. So I'm just gonna to toggle between these two so you can see the difference. There's the before photo or the original photo. And then there's after stopping down a little bit. So now that's a good enough starting point for us to go and do some editing. So I'm gonna take that photo, I'm gonna go into edit. There we go. Let me move my picture of myself out of the way here. And I'm gonna start off like I do with mini photos, I'm gonna use AI Auto. That's always a great starting point for me. You can see how that brought back a lot of that contrast. Remember the contrast that we had lost by using a softer light source, by using that piece of paper to soften it by sticking that AI auto on, it's automatically tuned the photo. It's giving me nice whites, nice darks, gives me a good contrast to start with on my photo. 
And if I'm looking for kind of a straight up photo, that's about it. There was not much more to do. I might crop it. You know, I didn't get quite the composition I love out of the camera. So I'll make a couple little tweaks here. I'm maybe gonna bring this down a little bit, bring this one in a little bit so that the flower itself is kind of more on the right hand third line. There we go, maybe something like that. But I tend to like to work in black and white. So I'm going to actually go to black and white. I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna use one of the built-in presets. We've got lots of great presets built in for this. And I'm just gonna go into the black and white modern category. I can click on black and white modern. I'll use the little quick view browser button right up here. This will let me preview all of those on my photo at that point. And then it's just kind of picking one that I think is a good starting point for it. I want to look at the flower. I want to pick one that's not going to blow out my highlights. Uh, I like one that's a little bit warmer, one that has a little bit of a vignette to it. Let's see which one's my fave out of here. Oh, I kind of like this one. I kind of like this really warm. No, this one. I can always change my mind and come back, pick something different. So there we go. Pick kind of a nice warm tone, black and white, almost like a, a sepia or coffee toner for it. And then I want to add a vignette. So I'm just going to zip over to effects. You'll notice here in effects, there's the two filters that it added. It added a glow. That's what kind of gives it that little bit of a soft richness to it. Gives it more of a film look. And then of course the black and white with the toner that made it black and white. I'm just going to add a vignette on top. So click on the add filter button. Let's go down to vignettes. And I'm just going to pick the vignette that I want. Let's start with, you guessed it, Big Softy. And I'm sure Nathan's giggling because we always pick Big Softy. It's our favorite vignette. I'm going to use the vignette centering tool to move that vignette around. I kind of want to make sure the middle of my flower is being equally lit and the rest of the scene is being darkened. Probably not quite that much. So let's grab that brightness slider and I'm just going to adjust it a little. There we go. I'm going to hit the tab key on my keyboard and that's going to hide all the junk around it. Let me see just the flower itself. Let me close my film strip up too. There we go. So that's what we created. Let's take a look at the before and the after. So there's before and after. This was shot basically in a closet with a 60 watt light bulb and a lamp and a piece of paper. And that's all it took to create the shot. So it didn't require a fancy studio, didn't require fancy equipment, very little to get started with. All right, questions on this one before I move on to our next example? Let's take a look here. If you have questions, go ahead and use the Q&A box there at the bottom of the screen window just to type up your question. Um, we've got a question about Apple Photos unrelated to the demonstration, but uh, yeah, we'll talk about how you can use On One within Apple Photos here in a little bit. If uh, Dan, did you, doesn't seem like anyone has any questions about this particular setup. If you want to continue moving okay. on or I can show them how to access and do I need to shoot? Do, do, do. do you need to shoot raw in order to use on one photo raw 2020? No, no, not at all. It'll work JPEGs, TIFFs, um, PNGs. PSDs, hike PSDs, files, hikes. you name it. And pretty much anything a photographer shoots mm -hmm. or creates that'll open. So. All right, so let's move on to the next one. The next one I did is actually this little uh, this little succulent guy right here. I'll hold it up so you guys can take a look at it. It's got these two pretty little succulents. They're pretty small. I mean, it's probably, I don't know, two, three inches tall. It's not very big. So for this one, I wanted to have a white background on it. Let me stop my screen share so you guys can see me a little bit bigger here real fast. There we go. So for this one, in order to create the white background, there's two plants in this, and I really only care about the forward plant. So to fix it without having my wife get mad at me for replotting her plant, I just took a sheet of white paper. This happens to be from my Canon printer. It's just a 13 by 19 sheet of normal paper. And I'm just gonna slide it right between the two plants. Watch this. Do, do, do. There we go. So now that lets me separate that little forward plant from the rear plant. I need something to hold it up. So I just had another roll of paper here. I'm just going to put something behind it and I can lean that paper against. There we go. So now that creates a white background behind that little, that little succulent. Move that out of the way so you guys can see. It's pretty small. And then I'm just going to readjust my camera 
and we'll take a picture of this. So I need to lower my camera down just a little bit. Recompose and focus on this guy. Now for this one, I want a really shallow depth of field. So I'm actually gonna shoot with my lens all the way open. This one happens to be a 2.8 all the way open. I'm looking for kind of an ethereal look. I'll show you guys in a second. These uh, the little spines on this almost look like a little octopus in a way. So I kind of want this blown out ethereal octopus look. So here's the very first shot. Let me share my screen again. That was our first shot. Yeah, again, first shots never look good. That doesn't look very good at all. So first off, it's two in focus. So I've got the front one and the middle ones are all in focus. I don't like that. And it's also pretty dark underneath. The light source that we have, that lamp over there, is pretty high. And none of the light is getting down on the underside of the plant. And I want to balance that out a little bit. So my next step is to make two changes. I need to open up the lens so that I get a shallower depth of field. I probably need to refocus my camera so that I'm making sure I'm getting just this one front spine. That's the most interesting one. And then I need to add a little bit of light. An easy way to add more light to it is just to bounce or reflect the light back up. If you have a little hand mirror, like a little cosmetics mirror, that works perfect for this. In this case, I had a little bit larger mirror. I had a plastic mirror. It's about a foot in size. You can actually get these as a remnant from your local glass shop. It worked perfect. So I'm just gonna put that underneath my camera. I'm gonna tip it up. And if you guys can see, let me move my camera out of the way. It's kind of hard to see through the webinar, but you can see how that fills in. It bounces the light from the lamp back up underneath and fills in those little spots on the succulent. So then when I take my next shot, it's gonna look more like this. Let's see, that was changing my depth of field, adding a little bit of light underneath and adjusting my focus so the great thing about shooting tethered is for each one of these little steps as i go along i can take a shot see it large on my screen make the adjustment for it so at that point i'm getting closer i'm starting to get kind of that creepy sci-fi octopus look that i like and there we go you can really see the difference that adding that mirror made so there's before very dark and adding that mirror you can see how it really brightened up underneath and lets us see the detail of that front little, I'll call it a tentacle in this case, because we're kind of going for an octopus look. There we go. Hey, Dan, I think uh, you might want to try to switch back and forth. Maybe something went out. People are saying they have a black screen. I see I'm okay. able to see okay. your screen, but let's just make sure. Um, and again, guys, Dan's bouncing, bouncing back and forth between screens. So um, if you may need Try to click here. on the thumbnail um, somewhere in the Zoom window to jump to the, to the other one, okay? Hopefully that's back. People can see it now or. And someone confirm out there for us. It'd be great. Yes, they can see now. It seems like it's back. Cool. Great. Um, I'll jump back and I'll show you where we started out here so we can go back. So again, here's that first shot. Again, don't like it too much is in focus, too dark underneath. So the adjustments I made were as to adjust my aperture. So if we go between these two, this first one was actually shot at F11. If we look over here, so that's gonna have a long depth of field. That's where I started on my last shot. The next one, I went wide open to 2.8. So you can see how the depth of field becomes much more narrow. Problem is, it's not focused in the right spot. So I need to make a couple adjustments here. I need to adjust my focus until I get the focus where I want. There we go. So now I'm focused just on that front tentacle. That's the one that's interesting to me. And then I, flexed in that mirror to add a little bit extra light underneath it. If you don't have a mirror, it's fine. You can just use a piece of white paper. It would do the same thing. It won't be quite as powerful, but it'll still fill in that area underneath it. That's the great thing about working on this small scale is you don't have to have big giant reflectors to do it. Anything could work. A three by five index card could make a great reflector for a shot like this. So there we go. That's our base shot. Let's go in and make some adjustments to it. So I'm gonna open this photo up into edit. There we go. I'm going to close my film strip here so we have a little bit more room to work. As soon as it finishes opening this guy. There we go. And I'm going to close up my preset drawer too so we can see this photo a bit better. That's our out of the camera shot. 
It's not bad. There's a few tweaks I want to make to it though. So the background is still a little bit warm. We're getting some spill light coming in from the windows in my studio, which is warming it up a little bit. And then I also want to go in and I need to get rid of this shadow down here. I don't really like the shadow that the light is casting. So I'm going to do a couple things. I'm going to grab my dropper tool for my white balance. I'm just going to click on my background. I know that background should be white. So I'm going to click on that. There we go. That brought us to a white background pretty quickly. I'll click on AI Auto. That gives us a good starting point. There we go. So that opened up the shadows a little bit. Now, I really want to take that white background and I want to blow it out. I want to make it look white. So I just grab my white slider right here and I'm just going to crank it up. You can see as I crank that white slider up, more and more of the whites are going to clip. It's going to give a more ethereal look to it. It's looking better. Bring our mids up just a little bit too so we can see underneath just a little bit more, maybe our shadows up. There we go. So we're getting kind of this overexposed ethereal look. That's looking pretty good. Now I need to get rid of this shadow down here. Easy way to do that. Let's just add a local adjustment. I'm going to make it lighter instead of darker. I can just start with a light and preset. That's going to use a plus one exposure to get us started. I'm gonna grab my brush. I wanna make sure I have a big 100% feather on it and 100% opacity to start. And now I'll just start painting over here to paint that out. Making sure I have that 100% soft edge. So I'm basically just increasing the exposure. I could paint with white and get to the same spot if I wanted to. As a matter of fact, I need a little bit more than a one-stop exposure. So I'm just gonna increase that slider up. There we go, to three. And that lets me lighten that up. I'm just gonna paint a little bit more in here. Just enough to kind of Soften up that edge. Cool, that's looking pretty good. Now, a couple things I don't like. There's a couple other little tentacles that were near to the same uh, focal plane, so they're a little bit too in focus. They draw a little more attention than I want. So I'm gonna blur those a little bit. But in order to blur it and make it look realistic, I have to use lens blur. So let's go to effects. I'm gonna click on the add filter button. And let's go to lens blur here. You see how lens blur gets added to the whole photo. I'm just gonna adjust the amount that I want. I'm gonna bring my amount up just a little bit more. And I'm also gonna bring my blooming up. The blooming is what takes the parts that are white, the little white spots, and it's gonna make those even brighter and blown out a bit more. Now I'm ready to paint that in. I'm gonna click on the mask button. I'm gonna invert it so that everything is the way it was. And now using my brush set to paint in, I could add some blur back to it. So I'm just gonna paint in some blur on the ones that are a little too obvious for me. Well, that's a good technique. I like that. Yeah. There we go. And then to push that illusion even farther, I'm going to paint a little bit more detail in here. So let's go back to our local adjustments and add one more adjustment. I'm going to use the detail preset that just turns the structure up. And I'm just going to paint that right here on the one that's in focus. There you go. Let's just paint in here a little bit. That's really going to make that one little spot right here that's in focus even more in focus. So it really draws our eye to that spot, just like that. Maybe one more adjustment. I'm going to go back to develop. Let's increase our vibrance just a little bit more. I really like those greens to be very, very bright green. There we go. All right, let's take a look at our before and our after. So there's before, that's out of the camera. Not very exciting. After, green space, octopus, just like that. Ooh, All right, uh, any questions clap. on that one? Golf clap for you, Dan. <laughs> Thank you, I appreciate the golf clap. So. Do we have any questions from our audience? Yeah, Pickle Boy wants to know, what's the difference between blur filter and lens blur filter in effects? Uh, good question. So there's a, a lots of different ways that you can blur via software. Uh, the normal blur that we're used to seeing is called a Gaussian blur. A Gaussian blur is going to blur kind of everything equally with a round shaped, um, I forget what they call it now. Um, uh, think of it like the aperture in your lens. It's basically a round, soft aperture that's going to cause that blur. So everything is going to blur, but it's going to look like computer blur. It's not going to look realistic. It's not like a photographic blur. There's lots of motion blurs and another one called box blur and surface blur. 
I like the lens blur. The lens blur is the one that actually is gonna make it look the most photographic. It actually uses a hard edged circle rather than a soft edge circle to do the blurring. And you can actually even change the shape of that if you want to. This isn't the best photo for it, but let me just turn up the amount here. Maybe I can make it show more here. So as I crank it up, you'll note how the spots that are out of focus still maintain that kind of that uh, circle around them, the bokeh is still there and I can actually adjust the amount of blooming, how much those little highlights bloom. And I can even change the sides and the shape of it. So if I wanted it to look like an octagon, I could do that. So let's go, I'm gonna make it eight sides and bring the curvature down. And you can see how I can actually change those specular highlights, their shape to make it look realistically out of focus like that. So much more control over what happens in the out of focus area and much more realistic look when it blurs. The other Great. cool thing about it is um, usually if you're trying to paint with a blur, it's actually going to give you half blur, half in focus. And it doesn't look realistic. It just looks smudgy. The lens blur is different. It actually uses the mask that you paint to vary the amount of blur. So let me, let me say that again. This amount slider down here, that is controlling the overall amount of blur. If I turn it all the way down to zero, obviously there's no additional blur added. And if I turn it up to like 55, there's a lot of blur added. If I was to adjust the opacity, this is what would happen if I was doing a normal blur. See how the blur looks fake up here? It just looks kind of smudgy. That doesn't look realistic. What I really want to do is I want to use a mask to modulate this amount, the real amount of blur. Lens blur is unique in that it does it that way. It actually changes the amount of blur. So instead of getting those halos, instead of getting that fake uh, smudgy look, it's really just varying the overall amount of blur when you paint with the mask. So that keeps it real. We're all about keeping it real, right, Nathan? Yeah, that's all we do around here. Dan, do you want to show, uh, we've got questions, how to invert those masks and if there's a shortcut? There is a shortcut. I think it's a control I or command I if you're on a Mac or you just hit this little button right here in the mask section. So when you click on the mask on any filter or any layer, it'll roll down a mask section. You can click on the invert button and that will then flip the mask. So instead of being white painting black, you're black uh, with painting white. You can also do that in the tool options bar up here for the mask as well. I've got all sorts of zoom stuff covering everything up here so I can't see exactly where the button is. There it is right there. And that little invert button will do the same thing. Great. Cool. Hey, any other questions so out there? Yeah, for anybody, if you have questions, go ahead and use the Q&A box down there at the bottom. This webinar is being recorded, um, so it will be posted to the On One video library and then our YouTube channel and all over so you can find it and watch it again later. And I don't see any new questions coming in, Dan. Did you have one more round for us? or That was the only two that I had a chance to pre-shoot before, uh, before the class with a feather shooting misbehaving, so... I apologize okay. for that. I don't know why. I think it's Zoom just wants to use it as a webcam, so it won't let us talk to the camera. That's all right. What 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 f-stop were you at with that photo you got there, Dan? This one I shot wide open at 2.8 because I really wanted a very shallow depth of field for it. Awesome. Great. Well, if anybody has any kind of questions about the overall presentation, um, again, all these things Dan used today were just items he found around the house. So hopefully you guys can go and find something around the house interesting to photograph to pass the time. And we're getting lots of nice comments coming in. Um, thank you for your outstanding webinar. Absolutely love on one. Thank you, Thomas. Cool. Well, thanks, everybody. Again, you know, these are the same kind of photos you can create. Nothing fancy here. Literally, it's my lamp for my bedside table and a piece of paper uh, was the only real stuff we used for creating these. So get out there and be creative. Even if you're stuck at home, there's, there's no reason you can't be creative. Definitely. And just to remind everybody again, we'll be doing a lot of these live webinars here over the next couple of weeks on one.com slash webinars. You can go there, register for all the webinars. You'll get reminders letting you know that we'll, when these uh, events will air. And of course, all of them will be recorded and posted online after um, thank you for the great explanation of lens blur dances, John. Thank you so much, Michael. And um, I think that's it. Cool. All right. Oh, thank oh, you very oh, much for coming. Oh, oh, sorry, I forgot to scroll. <laughs> great way for 
to be created while they're isolated. Thanks. Thanks. We got lots of thanks. I don't think, see any questions, Dan. I think that uh, that probably concludes today's presentation. Thank you, everybody that joined us. And again, this will be posted to the website shortly after it airs. All right. Cool. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Bye-bye. All right. Take care.